Okay, bon. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the first 4.1000 North American Regional Meeting. Uh, today we have our first roundtable entitled Farmers' Experiences and Proposals from the Ground. Bienvenue tout le monde à la première réunion régionale 4 pour 1000 uh, Amérique du Nord. La session d'aujourd'hui est notre première table ronde et s'intitule Retour d'expérience d'agriculteurs et propositions du terrain. So before we get started, um, I'd just like to explain a few uh, technical things to make sure that today's session goes smoothly for everyone. So today's session is going to be bilingual, uh, mostly in English with uh, the first presentation in French, and we're happy to be offering a simultaneous translation. Um, so I will invite all of you who would like to listen to uh, the presentations in English uh, to click on the interpretation icon um, at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen if you're on, if you're on your tablet and to select the English channel. Um, so our translators, our translators that are here with us today will translate uh, simultaneous the French, simultaneously the French parts into English. Um, so I'll be speaking French in just a second so you can, you can test the interpretation tool. Donc, quelques détails techniques avant de commencer. Nous offrons la traduction simultanée aujourd'hui. Euh, la session est bilingue, donc elle sera principalement en anglais avec la première présentation en français. Donc, pour écouter les présentations en anglais, Euh, dans la version française. Euh, donc, on vous invite à cliquer sur l'icône interprétation, euh, soit en bas de votre écran ou en haut de votre écran si vous êtes sur un téléphone euh, ou une tablette, et de choisir euh, la langue française. Euh, donc, nos traducteurs euh, vous guideront en français à travers la session. Si jamais vous avez besoin d'assistance, si vous avez des questions plus au niveau technique, je vous invite à les, les écrire dans le, le, le clavardage, donc le chat, et on va y répondre rapidement. On vous demanderait de garder l'outil Q&A, donc questions et réponses pour les questions, vraiment pour les, les panélistes. Donc, je vais revenir en anglais dans un instant. Vous pouvez tester l'outil de, de traduction. All right, so back to English now. Everyone should be able to understand. Can I get um, a few raised hands just to see who's using the interpretation tool? So to raise your hand, you can click on the hand icon that's uh, probably at the bottom of your screen or perhaps at the top of your screen. So whoever's using the interpretation tool can raise their hand. Oh, there we go. Okay, we see quite a few people. Awesome, amazing. Okay, you can put your hand back down, perfect. So now we should all be able to understand each other. Um, I'm Sarah Barsalou, Assistant Director at Regeneration Canada. Uh, we're extremely honored to be co-hosting this 4 for 1000 meeting. I'm here with my colleagues, Gabrielle, Antonius, and Jael, as well as our friend Beatrice from 4 for 1000, who will be helping make sure that everything goes smoothly today. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair and moderator of the session, Dr. Paul Lu, uh, who is Executive Secretary of the 4 for 1000 initiative since 2016. Paul. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second session of the regional meeting for the Fort Mill Initiative, which began yesterday with a session dedicated to policy on soil health and soil carbon sequestration at the national and regional level in North America. We had yesterday four presentations, two at the national level with Mrs. Lucy Clearwater from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, for Canada, and Mr. Sylvain Maestrachi, agricultural attaché at the French Embassy in Washington for the synthesis of the US policy. We also had two at the regional level with Mrs. Hélène Bourassa of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food of Quebec and Mrs. Jenny lester Moffitt, Under Secretary of Ministry of Food and Agriculture of California. Videos of the past session will soon be, will be available via our website or our YouTube channel which is currently being created. Presentations are available for our partners and members on our collaborative platform. Today, our session is dedicated to producer, be they farmers or breeder. Unfortunately, we will not have the chance to have Forrester with us. As yesterday, our session will take place online via Zoom, as Sarah just explained to you, thanks to the logistical organization of our friend at Regeneration Canada, as well as the contribution of the French Embassy in Washington DC, important partners whom I must once again warmly thanks 
for the involvement and support. Our session today should also last 90 to 120 minutes to allow sufficient time for exchanges. And we still have the comfort, as Sarah explained, of simultaneous translation in French and in English. As yesterday, being numerous online, we will be in webinar configuration, all microphones and camera will be turned off by default, with a section at your disposal for questions and answers. Thank, thank you for asking, when you ask a question, sorry, to start by specifying who the question is for, so that it will be easier for us to ask it on your behalf during our session. Even if you don't ask any question, you can like it so that we can easily identify the most popular question to ask first. Starting today and uh, at the end of each session, we will provide you with an online survey in the form of a multiple choice question to gather your opinion on a few targeted questions. Thank you for answering within the allotted time. Some questions are common to each session and other are specific to each session. So if you answer once, you can answer, also answer all the other session questions. Let me remind you that the objective of this regional meeting is to give the floor to all stakeholders who can act on soil carbon sequestration and soil health in North, in North America, decision maker, farmers, scientists, NGOs and companies. Everyone will therefore be able to present their point of view and interact with the others. At the end of the week of meetings, we hope to be able to, uh, to propose a synthesis in the form of a regional roadmap for concrete action on the ground in favor of soil carbon storage and soil health through agriculture and forestry. For our session today, devoted to producer, we will have four presentations of 15 minutes each. Although you have the summarized biography in the agenda, I would be grateful if each speaker could briefly introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentation. The presentation will be, as Sarah said, in French or in English. You will be able to choose the desired channel in the Zoom setting of your computer to access the desired language. And the material for this presentation will be available after the regional meeting on the website whose address will be communicated to you later. Last but not least, each session is recorded in order to also be available for those who cannot attend today and the following days. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Monsieur Jocelyn Michon, uh, an agriculteur Canadian, impliqué dans l'agriculture de conservation, Et je voudrais juste insister sur le fait que M. Michon travaille actuellement dans les champs et nous a fait l'amitié et l'honneur de prendre sur son temps de travail pour venir être avec nous. Donc, de façon à ce qu'il puisse sauver son précieux temps, je vais vous demander de poser vos questions dans la rubrique « Questions et answers » pendant sa présentation et il pourra y répondre directement après sa présentation. Et ainsi, il pourra retourner sur ses terres le plus vite possible pour continuer à vous nourrir. Monsieur Michon, vous avez la parole. C'est parfait. Bon, ben, merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. Merci pour euh, l'invitation. Euh, je vais y aller rapidement. 15 minutes, c'est vite passé. Euh, le titre de ma présentation euh, résume très bien euh, ce qui se produit lorsqu'on prend soin de son sol. Chez moi, ben, les sols sont non seulement en bonne santé, mais ils sont aussi très performants, tout en séquestrant euh, beaucoup de carbone. Notre ferme est située dans une des, belles, des plus belles régions agricoles euh, du Québec. Nous sommes situés environ 30 minutes à l'est de Montréal. Euh, notre secteur est rempli de fermes euh, modernes, dynamique et performante en production laitière, avicole et grande culture. Mon fils est avec moi depuis 2018. Il s'est joint à l'entreprise et c'est lui qui va prendre la relève par la suite. Au niveau de l'évolution des pratiques culturelles, bien, j'en suis à ma 47e année en agriculture. Je ne suis pas un petit genou, ça fait quand même un bon bout de temps. 
Et à mes débuts, j'ai commencé rapidement à, à, à pratiquer des méthodes de travail réduit du sol pour en venir finalement 35 ans plus tard, à, il y a 35 ans cette année, à l'abandon total de la charrue, la moldboard plow. Um, puis pour finalement arriver au semi-direct ou no-till, comme on le dit en anglais, en 1994. Donc, c'est ma 27e année chez moi sans, sans aucun travail de sol. Et on a fait, <coughs> excusez-moi, le jour de culture de couverture de cover crops à partir de 2003. Je sais que pour plusieurs citadins, euh, l'utilisation de pesticides et d'engrais chimiques, c'est la principale cause du mauvais état des sols, mais non, ce n'est pas le cas. L'impact est, est minime. Ce qui fait le plus grand dommage et des conséquences graves, bien, ce sont les outils de travail de sol, les charrues, chez elles, sous soleil et ainsi de suite. Euh, C'est une photo que j'ai prise ici en fin de au début février dans le sud de la France, euh, qui résume exactement ce qu'il ne faut pas faire et qui démontre bien qu'on est dans un processus de destruction des caractères, caractéristiques physiques et biologiques du sol. On assiste à une très grande dégradation des sols, en même temps perte de matière organique et de carbone, évidemment. Perte de biodiversité du sol. Euh, ces outils-là vont favoriser la compaction du sol, euh, plus de mauvaises infiltrations de l'eau et finalement, ben, c'est de l'eau qui ruisselle jusque dans les cours d'eau. Le poids des équipements est devenu de plus en plus grand, étant donné que les fermes sont de plus en plus grandes aussi. Le nombre d'agriculteurs diminue sans cesse. On a des équipements ici qui pèsent dans les 50, 60, 70 tonnes. On a la, la fameuse moissonneuse batteuse Sven, qu'on peut voir en bas à gauche, qui pèse à vide de 28 tonnes métriques et avec une capacité de charge de 12 tonnes, ça fait 40 tonnes. Donc, on, on fait un grand stress à nos sols avec des, des équipements qui sont très, très lourds. Alors, après avoir créé du béton en labourant les sols, bien, il faut concasser tout ça avec des outils. Ici, en bas à gauche, on a une herse rotative. Certains producteurs vont passer deux fois pour réussir à émietter tout ça. On a des outils aussi de pulvérisation pour vraiment rendre le sol favorable à un bon semis. Par contre, ça réduit l'infiltration de l'eau et on accentue le ruissellement. C'est le même champ bétonné que je vous ai montré. C'est une photo que mon ami m'a envoyée. C'est le même champ qui, on voit, est sursaturé en eau après 40 mm d'eau. C'est une photo qui a été prise le dimanche. On se retrouve dans des situations comme ça ici, comme on peut le voir souvent dans de nombreux champs au Québec. Au printemps, à la fonte de la neige, l'eau ruisselle amenant avec elle des, des bons des sédiments, des bonnes particules de sol, en même temps que des pesticides et des, des fertilisants. Même au mois de juin, comme on peut l'avoir au, au centre, et après un orage ou un événement plus vieux assez important, l'eau ne peut pas s'infiltrer dans le sol et elle ruisselle jusque dans le chemin et se retrouve souvent dans les cours d'eau et demain dans les rivières. Par contre, on peut renverser tout ça avec l'agriculture sur sol vivant, qui consiste à, à abandonner totalement le travail du sol, ce qu'on appelle le no-till, bien connu mondialement par sur cette expression-là. En français, on va dire semi-direct parce que c'est plus facile à dire que le non-travail de sol. Euh, par, aussi, on, par l'ajout de diversité avec des cultures de couverture, cover crops, et aussi euh, on fait même ce qu'on appelle le semi sous couvert végétal vivant. En anglais, on dit « planting green » pour faire contraste avec euh, « euh, planting brown » sur un sol travaillé. Bon, pour ceux qui ne savent pas ce que c'est que le semi-direct ou le no-till, ben, j'ai mis des photos pour que vous compreniez mieux. Vous voyez en haut à gauche, je sème du soya dans des résidus de maïs. À droite, je sème des pois sur, dans du seigle vivant. En bas à gauche, je sème du, euh, des haricots sur un, sur un précédent soya sur lequel on avait semé du seigle. Et à droite, c'est un semi, en bas à droite, c'est un semi de maïs dans du seigle qui est encore vivant. C'est ça du semi-direct. Après plusieurs années de cette pratique-là, on assiste à un rétablissement de la biologie du sol, des qualités biologiques. Donc, les vers de taille sont en augmentation, les champignons, bactéries, les microbes, toute la vie du sol, en fait, qui est en augmentation. On assiste aussi au rétablissement des qualités physiques du sol. Euh, la première conséquence, c'est une augmentation de la matière organique. Euh, chez moi, sur les, les années que j'ai été en semi-direct, on, on a une augmentation de 1,7 On est bien loin du 4 pour 1000, du 0,4 par année. Mais en grande culture, c'est difficile d'atteindre ce chiffre-là. Je dirais même que c'est impossible. Chez moi, c'est plutôt 0,07 par année d'augmentation. Et ce qui est important pour moi, c'est que l'augmentation de matière organique me permet d'avoir un, un surplus ou une réserve d'eau 
pour passer les périodes sèches de l'été allant jusqu'à 400 ml d'eau par hectare, ça représente une pluie. J'ai en réserve 40 mm de pluie euh, pour passer des périodes sèches. Euh, aussi, sans travail de sol, bien un développement des, de toutes les, les, les choses dans le sol, les mycorhizes, les champignons qui, se, qui vivent en symbiose avec les plantes, euh, qui permettent aux plantes d'explorer beaucoup plus de surface de sol jusqu'à mille fois même. Euh, développement aussi euh, de la glomaline, qui est très important. La glomaline contient environ 30 du carbone de la planète, donc c'est important qu'on la laisse se développer euh, dans le sol. Et euh, tout ça fait en sorte d'avoir une meilleure agrégation. La glomaline, c'est un peu comme une colle qui va coller les particules de sol entre elles et ça va permettre une plus grande stabilité structurelle, une, cap une capacité plus grande à résister à l'impact de l'eau et au passage des machineries. Et on améliore aussi l'infiltration de l'eau et l'aération. Donc, il y a beaucoup de qualités qui viennent avec le non-travail de sol. C'est une photo que j'ai prise à la fin du mois de mars, lors de, de la fonte de la neige. Vous pouvez voir, je ne sais pas si vous voyez bien sur vos écrans, mais l'eau est limpide, c'est très propre. Il n'y a pas de sédiments, ce n'est pas de l'eau qui brûle. Donc, à la rivière, ce n'est pas de l'eau qui va faire brûler la rivière. Euh, je cultive 236 hectares. Nous cultivons 236 hectares, c'est près de 600 acres, pour ceux qui ne sont pas familiers avec les hectares, de maïs, de soya et des légumes de transformation. En fait, ce sont des, des pois de conserverie et des haricots, euh, des haricots de conserverie. La rotation est simple, c'est soya, maïs, soya, légumes et maïs. Donc, les légumes reviennent une fois aux quatre ans. Par contre, je sème à chaque année, après ces cultures-là, du seigle, du seigle d'automne, qu'on va implanter à l'automne, qui va être présent le printemps suivant au moment des semis, comme je vous ai montré sur une des photos précédentes. Ce que j'aime beaucoup des légumes, c'est qu'on les, les récolte assez tôt, ce qui me permet de semer un mélange multi-espèces de, de cultures de couverture, et c'est l'année où est-ce que j'applique le fumier. Je reçois du fumier de dinde, environ 600 tonnes par année, et c'est ma fertilisation de base, je vais chercher avec ça 80 du phosphore et 90 de la potasse qui est appliquée sur ma ferme. On dit que les plantes forment les sols. Bien, chez moi, j'essaie d'en avoir le plus longtemps possible. Ça permet une plus grande séquestration de carbone, une augmentation de la matière organique, évidemment. Ça euh, va prévenir la compaction, améliorer la structure du sol. Euh, une, ça aide aussi à réduire l'érosion. Même on élimine l'érosion, j'en ai plus d'érosion de sol. Euh, ça va permettre aussi de capter les éléments fertilisants euh, pour éviter les lessivages. Euh, les plantes vont aller, certaines plantes comme le tournesol qui ont des racines qui vont en profondeur vont pomper des minéraux pour les ramener à la surface. Production d'azote avec les légumineuses. Euh, on voit aussi euh, beaucoup plus d'insectes maintenant dans nos champs. Et euh, les plantes de couverture ont un contrôle, améliorent le contrôle des mauvaises herbes à condition que les couverts soient bien réussis. Bon, je vais faire une visite des champs maintenant. L'idée chez nous, c'est de couvrir le sol en permanence pour séquestrer le plus de carbone possible. Une des caractéristiques d'un sol, sol vivant, c'est l'uniformité. Comme vous pouvez voir dans ce champ de maïs, c'est bien uniforme. L'année qui a suivi, on a un champ de soya. Chaque plant a la même chance de bien produire. Vous voyez qu'il n'y a pas de, pas de, de, de vagues. C'est très uniforme. Même chose pour le champ de blé qui suit. Donc, tous les raccoins du champ sont en bon état. Après la récolte de blé, on a laissé toute la paille au champ, ça a été éparpillé. On a semé un mélange multi-espèces de plantes de couverture et c'est ce que ça a donné à la fin d'octobre. Là-dedans, on a des, des graminées, on a des crucifères, brassica, et des légumineuses. Puis on a aussi la facélie, facélia, qui, est, qui fait, ne fait pas partie de ces, de ces familles-là. Donc, on essaie d'avoir des plantes différentes qui vont jouer différents rôles. Le printemps suivant, euh, étant donné que les plantes étaient gélives, donc détruites par le gel pendant l'hiver, il ne reste à peu près que le chaume de, de blé. Et on va semer là-dedans sans aucun travail de sol. Et ici, on est, on est au mois de juin, oui, de, au juin au début juillet, au 4 juillet, c'est ça. Et j'aime beaucoup cette photo-là parce que ça représente très bien ce qu'on cherche à faire, un sol qui est toujours protégé, qui est recouvert, qui va réduire l'évaporation de l'eau puis qui va contrer aussi, contrôler, le, réduire l'érosion. Suite à la récolte, qui est excellente en passant, on a semé un autre mélange multi-espèces, 14 espèces qu'on peut voir ici au 14 septembre. Euh, chaque année, on ajoute puis on fait des, des, des retraits de différentes plantes selon, euh, selon les besoins ou selon notre estimation. Suite à un voyage en Ohio euh, que j'ai fait en 2010 pour aller visiter des producteurs en Saint-Misérec, j'ai euh, pris l'habitude de semer du seigle d'automne 
après les humicultures pour remplacer d'autres plantes de couverture, mais le sec, j'aime bien. On peut le semer même après le maïs. Euh, on peut voir ici, on est au 13 décembre, on voit le sec qui passe à travers les résidus de maïs. Vous voyez que le sol est toujours bien couvert. Le printemps suivant, on, on réussit à faire un semis sous couvert végétal vivant, ce qu'on appelle le SCV. Euh, le sec va être plus ou moins développé, tout dépendant de la date de semis à l'automne et le, la, la chaleur qu'on peut avoir au printemps et la date de semis, évidemment, de, de soya parce que j'ai déjà semé du soya dans du seigle qui était mature à un mètre et demi de long. Donc, tout se passe bien en dessous euh, du soya pendant la saison. Le seigle est disparu. Il est devenu une euh, matière organique labile qui a stimulé l'activité biologique du sol et permet au, 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 à la culture d'en de, 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 profiter. Et euh, le rendement à la fin est toujours, toujours très bon. Ici, c'est un rendement au-delà de 4 tonnes à l'hectare, c'est-à-dire au au-delà de 60 boisseaux. Alors, avec aucune fertilisation, aucun fongicide, pour aucun insecticide qui a été appliqué. Un sol résilient fait des plantes plus résilientes qui vont aussi se mieux se défendre contre les ravageurs. Ici, on est en pleine récolte de soya et il y a mon fils qui sème du seigle en même temps. Puis, on voit ce que ça a donné au mois de novembre. On a du seigle qui a été semé en bande parce qu'on prévoit du semer du maïs et le maïs n'aime pas toujours ça pousser dans du seigle euh, vivant. Donc, on laisse des bandes non semées pour implanter le maïs dans ces bandes-là. Euh, ce ce champ-là très bien fonctionné avec un excellent rendement. On peut voir ce que ça donne. On, après, la, après les semis, bien, on a détruit le seigle parce que c'est du maïs qu'on va avoir et non, et non du seigle. On a utilisé du glyphosate, bien entendu, le fameux glyphosate qui nous rend de très précieux services, qui nous permet d'économiser une centaine de litres de carburant par hectare. Bon, je vous parlais de performance. J'ai des, des indicateurs ici que je présente de plus en plus. Évidemment, on peut parler de rendement par hectare ou par unité de surface. Je, je vais utiliser les données de la financière agricole du Québec, qui est un organisme du gouvernement qui gère les assurances, récolte et le, le, le financement aussi. Et euh, elle nous, euh, on est assuré avec un, un taux qui correspond au, au rendement qu'on réussit à, à bâtir sur 15 années. Donc, mon rendement moyen est, au cours des 15 dernières années de 13,2 tonnes, ce qui fait en boisseau à l'arbre. Pour ceux qui sont mieux, plus familiers, c'est de 210 boisseaux. Et la moyenne de mon secteur, qui est le meilleur secteur au Québec, est de 11,9. Donc, 11 environ 11 de plus que le meilleur secteur au Québec. Et la moyenne du Québec est à 8,9 tonnes. Donc, j'ai environ 40 de rendement au-dessus de, de la moyenne du Québec. Euh, une deuxième façon, c'est de calculer la quantité nécessaire d'azote pour produire une tonne de maïs. La moyenne en fertilisation, que ce soit ici au Québec, en Ontario, aux États-Unis, euh, c'est autour de 18 kg par tonne de maïs. Et chez moi, on est à 10,6. Donc, ça prend un sol qui est très performant pour euh, réussir à produire autant sans, sans beaucoup d'azote. En fait, j'applique 130 unités d'azote alors que les gens en appliquent 180. C'est l'autre facteur de performance, mais je vous dirais que c'est celui que je préfère, qui va représenter euh, tout ce qu'on cherche à faire, là, la protection de l'environnement, réduction des gaz à effet de serre, euh, la séquestration de carbone. C'est la, la productivité par litre de carburant consommé sur l'entreprise. On ramène ça à l'hectare. Pour chaque hectare, chez moi, je produis 412 litres. Si je, me, si je prends le rendement de 13,2 tonnes avec 32 litres de carburant par hectare, ça fait 412 litres, alors que la moyenne du Québec est à 97 kg. Donc, c'est quatre fois plus de production par rapport à la moyenne. Et j'ai des amis qui sont en production biologique qui, ont la, qui peinent à faire 50 kg de maïs par, par litre de carburant utilisé. Bon, je fais des légumes depuis une dizaine d'années, des légumes de transformation pour bon duel. Euh, généralement, ces sols-là doivent être euh, laissés laissé à nu, très propres, hyper manicurés, aucun résidu à la surface. Mais moi, dans mes conditions, c'était de, de pouvoir le faire en semi-direct. On m'a permis de le faire et les résultats sont assez surprenants. Les rendements sont très bons. Euh, ça, c'est la récolte 2019 où est-ce que j'ai eu... Euh, à peu près 40 ou 50 plus élevé, 60 plus élevé que la moyenne, que le bon rendement espéré. Donc, c'était très satisfaisant. Après la récolte, bon, on ne fait que euh, éparpiller les résidus et bien épandre ça à la surface du sol et on sème un mélange multi-espèces, comme on peut voir ici, en septembre. 
Et c'est dans ces conditions-là qu'on va appliquer le fumier de dinde, qui est incorporé non pas dans le sol, mais dans le couvert. C'est le, le couvert végétal qui va, c'est les plantes de couverture qui vont rabrier et s'en délecter. Ce qui nous permet d'avoir des photos superbes en fin d'automne, euh, malgré la grisaille de l'automne, d'avoir des beaux plants, des belles plantes qui sont encore en fleurs dans les champs. Et euh, on parle beaucoup d'insectes. Ben, chez moi, il y en a beaucoup. Comme on peut voir sur la photo, sur le tournesol, ben, on a des abeilles qui viennent polliniser. Le printemps suivant, c'est un petit peu plus triste. Là. Les résidus sont, sont morts, sont laissés à la surface, mais on sème là-dedans sans aucun travail de sol et ça fonctionne très bien. Euh, c'est une photo qui date de l'année passée parce que le maïs semé de cette année est encore en train de germer. Et euh, le, la levée est impeccable. Euh, je reviens à du haricot. Ça, c'est en 2017. J'ai semé des haricots entre des bandes de seigle. On a détruit le seigle parce que c'est des haricots qu'on veut avoir. Et euh, c'était une, une première, ça, ça ne s'était jamais fait, du semi direct d'haricots dans du seigle. Euh, et les résultats ont été euh, surprenants. Puis, en semi direct, par le fait qu'on ne travaille jamais le sol, bien, les oiseaux euh, peuvent, qui nidifient dans les champs peuvent venir euh, faire leur nid. Et ça, moi, j'ai beaucoup d'oiseaux euh, aussi dans mes champs. On trouve beaucoup de nids d'oiseaux. Bon, pendant la saison, la culture s'est très bien développée. En pré-récolte, on a pu voir les, les plants étaient bien chargés, euh, ils sont très bons. On dit qu'un sol vivant et en santé pourra produire des aliments beaucoup plus simples ou beaucoup plus nutritifs. D'ailleurs, les opérateurs des, des machineries qui viennent chez moi me disent que mes, mes haricots sont toujours euh, euh, plus sucrés que ce qu'ils voient à l'extérieur. Donc, par la suite, après la récolte, bien, encore une fois, on va semer des plantes de couverture qui vont se développer à l'automne, c'est laissé tel quel. Euh, dernier champ, euh, c'est un champ qui était prévu en haricot, euh, pour être semé en haricot en juin, en début juin. Finalement, ça a été reporté jusqu'au 15 juin, qui était la date limite pour pouvoir les semer. Étant donné que c'était prévu de semer tard, tardivement, on a euh, choisi de semer un mélange d'avoine, de, de sarrasin et de moutarde pour faire travailler le sol un peu. Et on a détruit euh, ce mélange-là. On a semé les haricots euh, qui se sont euh, très bien euh, développés. Et euh, la récolte est ex ex excellente encore une fois. Voilà, je suis rendu au bout. Et puis, tout simplement pour dire que couvrir les sols en permanence favorise la séquestration du carbone. Voilà, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, euh, M. Michon. Je ne sais pas si j'ai récupéré la parole. Je n'ai pas récupéré l'écran. Je vous en tout cas. Je vois bien que vous quittiez l'écran, s'il vous plaît. Oui, euh, quittez l'écran. Quittez, quittez. quittez le partage d'écran. OK, c'est bon. Et puis, euh, on a quelques questions pour vous. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. En tous les cas, c'est très riche et surtout, surtout très illustré. C'est souvent ce qui manque dans les présentations que nous, que nous avons. On a effectivement beaucoup d'images beaucoup qui montrent que eh bien, ces, ces sols sont vivants, mais pas seulement les sols, tout ce qui est au-dessus aussi est, est, est extrêmement vivant. Alors, on a plusieurs questions qui sont arrivées pour vous, euh, M. Michon, si vous voulez bien y répondre. Euh, ouais. Peut-être la première, vous avez déjà répondu à une des questions qui consiste à demander comment est-ce que vous détruisez le, le seigle avant de planter dedans, mais vous l'avez dit, vous pouvez le répéter, mais euh, donc en utilisant... Euh, en, fait, en fait... Euh... Le, je ne tiens pas compte du fait qu'on a des, des, des plantes de couverture. C'est le même programme de désherbage qu'on a, même si a... C'est la même chose, il n'y a, a pas de différence. J'utilise euh, du glyphosate en prélevé du maïs avec un antiquitamine résiduel. D'accord. Notre question qui vous a été posée, c'est euh, les, les cultures que vous développez sur votre exploitation, sont-elles vendues... Euh, individuellement, vous-même, à travers des contrats avec des compagnies Vous avez parlé de bon duel. Est-ce que c'est euh, collectif à travers des coopératives Et est-ce que ce que vous produisez, par exemple le, le maïs et le soja, servent essentiellement à nourrir les animaux pour l'alimentation animale Bon, euh, ben, Les légumes, c'est pour le bon duel, c'est un contrat. Euh, le soya, je suis producteur, je suis multiplicateur de semences, donc c'est des semences qui vont, de, qui vont être ressemées. C'est un contrat aussi avec Solio Agriculture. La, la coopérative fédérée. Euh, 
Le maïs, euh, j'ai euh, deux clients producteurs laitiers qui veulent avoir du maïs humide, non séché, que je leur fournis à la récolte. Sinon, le reste, le reste est séché ici puis que je vends par l'entremise de, de ma coopérative. Que j'écoule euh, assez régulièrement au, au, au fil de l'année. Très bien, on a une dernière question qui, qui touche euh, aux chiffres que vous avez indiqués. Vous, mm -hmm. vous indiquiez que vous arriviez à stocker, selon vos calculs, 0,07% de, de carbone enfin, de, dans vos sols ouais. chaque mm -hmm. année. Et euh, donc, la question qui, qui est posée, c'est quels sont, selon vous, les facteurs qui empêchent d'atteindre le, le chiffre de 4 pour 1000 si, si on voulait prendre ce chiffre comme référence C'est juste un indicateur, mais... Euh, c'est une bonne question. C'est difficile à répondre quand même. Euh, euh, pourquoi on ne peut pas faire mieux que 0,07 par année euh, ben ici, il y a le climat, en fait. Des couverts, des beaux couverts végétaux, j'en ai une fois aux quatre ans. Le seigle n'a pas vraiment le champ de chance de se développer énormément. Puis on a des cultures euh, à chaque année. Si on avait des prairies, si on avait des animaux, euh, ça serait peut-être autre chose. Là. Mais étant donné qu'on est en culture annuelle, euh, puis on est dans des sols aussi où est-ce que le taux de matière organique euh, euh, ne monte pas facilement. Et euh, ben, on a parti d'un taux qui était quand même assez bas dans le temps. Je me souviens, on était à, à 1,5 à 1,7 en matière organique. Maintenant, on est dans les 3. 3 on a jusqu'à du 4, 4,5. Il y a une augmentation qui a été faite, mais en moyenne, c'est ça, c'est à peu près 1,7. Je n'ai pas voulu aller plus haut que ça, mais peut-être 2. Peut-être 2 de moyenne. Ce qui est d'un autre type de sol. Oh, on ne vous entend plus. Désolé, je ne sais pas, il s'est passé quelque chose avec votre micro. Non, ça ne marche plus. C'est venu Oui, voilà, c'est bon. Okay. Euh, Peut-être on peut, on peut oser une dernière question, parce que ça fait aussi partie de, de, du questionnaire qui sera posé en ligne. Euh, de votre expérience, euh, qu'est-ce que, selon vous, bloque l'adoption par des, un plus grand nombre d'agriculteurs de pratiques qui sont euh, finalement, euh, qui paraissent assez simples quand on regarde les photos. Hein. On fait moins de travail, on consomme moins d'énergie, euh, on utilise moins d'engrais de, minéraux, moins de produits phytosanitaires, et au final, on a des productions qui sont plus belles, plus nutritives. Alors finalement, qu'est-ce qui empêche euh, les gens qui sont autour de vous de faire pareil? C'est une bonne question. Euh, moi, personnellement, ça fait 20 trois ans que je parle à semi direct à mes confrères, à mes collègues. Et puis, euh, il y a une progression qui se fait. Euh, L'adoption de ces pratiques-là est lente. Euh, il y a quand même des risques financiers qui viennent avec ça. Moi, j'ai fait une transition progressive sur plusieurs années. Donc, je n'ai pas eu de baisse de rendement quand je suis passé au, au non-travail de sol. Aujourd'hui, euh, on dirait qu'il faudrait que ça fonctionne immédiatement. La première année, tout est parfait, tout est beau. Euh, plusieurs ont fait des essais et ont abandonné. Euh, souvent, on abandonne la troisième année. Pourquoi on ne persiste pas plus? Euh, je l'ignore aussi, je, mais je pense que c'est un manque de formation, un manque de suivi ou un manque d'accompagnement. Euh, les incitatifs euh, financiers ne sont pas présents. On a eu des, des petits montants dans certains programmes qui viennent rendre les choses un peu plus roses et un peu plus intéressantes, mais il n'y a pas de, de suivi vraiment à long terme, comme on peut le voir dans le Farm Bill aux États-Unis, où est-ce que des producteurs reçoivent des montants, s'engagent à, à adopter des pratiques, puis ils reçoivent des montants sur plusieurs années. Ici, dans notre cas, on n'a pas ça. On n'a pas ça du tout. Euh, je, écoutez, je ne sais pas quoi vous dire. Si mmh, euh, non, je ben connaissais ça, la déjà... réponse, euh, je ne serais pas ici aujourd'hui pour en parler. <rire> c'est déjà, déjà très clair. C'est déjà très clair. Bon, il y a une, enfin, un dernier élément qui, qui ressort des questions qui sont posées. Il a, il, vous avez indiqué que vous n'utilisiez euh, pas ou peu euh, de produits phytosanitaires ou et pas ou peu d'engrais minéraux. Si j'ai bien compris, vous mettez quand même de l'azote. Euh, oui. à certains moments. Oui. Euh, les, les produits phytosanitaires que vous utilisez en dehors du glyphosate, euh, ils sont, 
il y en a beaucoup, il n'y en a pas beaucoup euh, par rapport à, à l'agriculture conventionnelle? Euh, ben, déjà, là, je, moi, je ne mets pas de fongicides ni d'insecticides sur les cultures en croissance. C'est déjà un, un bon départ. Euh, ça représente peut-être 30 mais ce 30 %-là, au niveau des risques pour l'environnement et des risques pour la santé, il dépasse les 50 parce que ce sont des produits qui sont beaucoup plus à risque euh, que les herbicides. Euh, une des choses que j'ai remarquées aussi, je n'ai jamais besoin de revenir pour retraiter une deuxième fois. On ne fait qu'une fois avec des doses qui sont euh, réduites, les plus faibles doses possibles. Mais avec le glyphosate, on utilise la dose qui est régulière pour ne pas euh, provoquer de résistance inutile des plantes. Parce qu'à chaque fois qu'on va utiliser un produit à petite dose sur un plant qui est devenu trop grand, bien, on a les chances que ce, la plante, il y a des chances que la plante... Euh, s'en habitue et qu'elle devienne résistante. Donc, il faut utiliser le produit de la bonne façon. Très bien. Eh bien, écoutez, merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur Michon. On va, on va vous libérer, on va vous laisser retourner sur votre exploitation et, et continuer l'installation des cultures pour cette, cette nouvelle année avec le printemps qui, qui arrive. Merci, merci encore. Merci, Paul, et puis euh, bonne journée à tous. Au revoir. À la prochaine. So after after experience with uh, Mr. Michon, who was more involved with uh, vegetable, I mean, planting and uh, vegetal population, let's go for um, a, a breeder and somebody who is working more with animals. Our second speaker is Mr. Paul Slump. He is a Canadian rancher who practices holistic grazing techniques on for his herd. And uh, we will hear from him what experience he has and how it is very it is interesting for for the the breeding in this part of the world. Mr. Paul Slump, you have the floor. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just wait um, for someone to uh, put my presentation on the screen. Um, in the meantime, I'll, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I, my name is Paul Slomp, um, and I farm also in Quebec. Um, I'm about uh, 90 minutes uh, towards Ottawa uh, from, from Montreal. Uh, we farm about 300 acres here, and um, we, have, uh, we have a bunch of livestock on the farm. Our main enterprise uh, are beef cattle, but we also have uh, pigs, And we do have a very small amount of uh, chicken uh, that we use for, for eggs as well. Um, so um, I'll, I'll briefly run through uh, what we do on our farm and how we manage our farm. And then uh, at the tail end of the conversation, I'll, I'll dive into some of the questions around why I think, um, yeah, not more people are adopting these practices, what some of the barriers are. And um, yeah, kind of, I've been ruminating about, um, about this question quite a bit, um, it, it, especially in light of, um, of uh, uh, this organization to see what kind of work we can be doing um, to help more farmers adapt these practices. So I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. And next slide, please. So this is, um, this is a picture of the cattle on our farm. Um, we, we practice something that's called mob grazing. So, so in its essence, um, we keep uh, uh, one herd of cattle um, and there will be uh, an age range between uh, like zero days of age to 12 to 14 years of age uh, of our livestock in our herd. We keep everything together. Um, And we move them across our fields uh, very similarly to how, how wild, uh, wild herds would be moving um, through their native rangelands. So um, we move our cattle between uh, two and eight times a day. Um, and we do it in such a fashion that we keep them really close together so that uh, they have access to all of the, to eating uh, as much of the fresh grass as they they want in the time period that they're there and they have a chance to put their feet everywhere they have a chance to pee and poo everywhere and then we take them off that uh, that grass um, and let the grass recover um, for a certain number of days before we come back with the cattle 
Next slide, please. So the result of, of having um, our cattle so close together is what I'm trying to show in these pictures. And um, what you see in the top there is there's still a lot of um, uh, grass matter that's there, but it has, it has been totally trampled and it's, it's flat, it's lying flat on the soil surface. So it's providing a really nice mulch, but it's still green. Um, and then in the bottom picture, I'm holding up um, the, uh, plant to see, to show you how much of that plant has been grazed by an animal. So if you look, you can see that, that only part of the leaf is missing, but there's still a part of the leaf intact. So uh, the, um, the reason for this, or the, like, this is, this is like 100% grazing. Like I give myself an A grade on this. We don't hit this all the time. Um, but the reason we're going for this is um, we want to, the cow to take about 50% of the plant. In the a, a cow, when they graze, they always uh, start eating at the tips of the leaves first. And the reason for that is that the tips of the leaves are fully exposed to, to sunlight. And so all of the photosynthesis is happening at the tips of the leaves. So when a cow eats the tips of the leaves, they actually get the most energy that they could possibly get out of that grass. Um, the second benefit uh, from that is that the, they, they, there's a, a part of the leaf that's remaining. And that part of the leaf that's remaining will continue to photosynthesize. So I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, of driving through the countryside um, and a crop of hay has just been taken off and you see a color change. Um, it was very lush, dark green before uh, the crop of hay gets taken off. And then the, uh, there's a very light green or a yellowish color um, that takes the place as this, these plants start to regenerate growth and start to grow up again. What, what happens there is this, this really dark green color. That's the, the color of photosynthesis. And that's the color of carbon sequestration. So the, the plants that are that color are capturing sunlight and taking carbon dioxide out of the air and, and uh, creating sugar chains that they're using to nourish themselves, but they're also pumping that into the soil to feed the soil. So that color is excellent. When, when you see that light green color or yellowish color, that is the color of a plant using its, its root reserve to regenerate a leaf so that it can restart to photosynthesize. In when a plant is that color, there's no photosynthesis happening and there's no carbon being captured out of the atmosphere and being put into the soil. So the reason I want my cattle to only take part of the leaf is so that the plant can maintain its dark brown color and it can continue to photosynthesize and it can continue to capture carbon and pump carbon into the soil. And um, so that's, that's kind of the, the goal. Um, so those two, those two things, one for the maximization of carbon sequestration and photosynthesis, and the other one um, of the cows only eating the tips of the leaf, because if they only eat the tips of the leaf, they get the most energy and they actually grow the best and are, are able to maintain their health the best. So it's, it's a win-win situation. Next slide, please. Um, what you see here, this is our, uh, our sounder of pigs. And um, we use these pigs um, mainly as a, as a phytosanitary measure. So uh, we haven't been on our farm for very long. Uh, there are a lot of uh, fields that have uh, what you see these, these pigs in right now. These are sedge grasses and the cattle really uh, don't like eating them. They're very rough and they, they kind of act like sandpaper in your mouth. Um, so what we use the pigs for is to clean, um, to clean the fields uh, of these sedges um, so that uh, um, the grass that the cows do like and can uh, photosynthesize a lot more aggressively um, can take the place of these sedges. So what we'll do is we'll come in with these pigs um, uh, to let them kind of root up all of these unwanted species uh, and then we can come in and plant more desired species um, and then we use the cows to maintain, um, maintain the grass stand uh, in a photosynthetic state. So um, what I really want to point out is that the, 
economically my farm survives because we sell meat of these animals. But really all of these animals have an enormous role to play in the total farm ecosystem. Um, and all of the farms have a purpose, uh, all of the animals on our farm have a purpose beyond um, becoming meat. Their purpose is to help us um, regenerate and um, maintain a healthy ecosystem that can maximize the carbon capture. And so every animal on our farm has a specific role to play to help us obtain that goal. Next slide, please. So um, I do farm in Quebec. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, a, 180 to 200 days of winter where there isn't very much growing. Um, but I think what's, what's important for us is to, um, to continue to condition the cattle to um, be used to living in this environment. So rather than keeping our, our animals indoors and rather um, than feeding them hay too early on, we want to uh, prolong the grazing season as much as possible. And so what these two photos show um, is there's still a lot of green biomass underneath the snow. And as you can see by these snow covered muzzles, the cattle are very happy to dig through, um, you know, up to a, a foot to two feet of snow um, to access all the green material that's underneath. And, and, the cat, and because that grass has been freeze dried, um, there's a lot of energy in there and cattle uh, will gain a lot of weight eating this kind of stuff. Um, one of the challenges that we have in our region is that often the snow is, uh, is a little bit moist and as soon as that turns into ice, the cattle will have a hard time uh, accessing the plant material underneath. Um, so they won't be able to continue to graze it, but um, the residue of those grasses actually provide a really good uh, cover um, and mulch layer for the regrowth in the spring. And you, we often see that our greenest fields are the ones that uh, went into the winter with the longest grass stand remaining. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of what we do in the winter to, uh, to get as much carbon into the ground. This is a practice called bale grazing. And what you can see there, um, we put out a whole bunch of round bales in a checker pattern um, uh, in a field. Um, so these bales are placed at about uh, six meters apart or 20 feet. Um, and every day we'll move an electric fence um, to give access uh, to new bales for the cows to graze. Um, next slide, please. And as you can see, we can do that in a significant amount of snow. And these cows, uh, the snow is deeper than their bellies. Um, but because the bales are so close, they only need to move about 10 feet through that really deep snow to get to the cow, uh, to the feed. And they will actually trample that snow down uh, to a hard pack. Um, and um, they'll have a lot of space to, uh, to move on um, uh, to the next bales after that. So especially the big cows will come in first, trample the snow, and then the little calves will have access as well. Next slide, please. Here is a, a better picture uh, just to see how much snow that we're working through. And um, there, there was upwards of five feet of snow. And so the tips of the bales were just popping out uh, above the snow. Next slide, please. This is kind of what this, this is the goal of, of this um, feeding method. And um, we aim to leave about 25% of a round bale scattered across the field um, like this. Um, so we were able to create about an inch of mulch uh, ar around much of the field. There are some patches um, where the snow was really deep that doesn't get that mulch, but by and large, uh, I guess we cover about 90 to 95 percent of our field with mulch. Um, next slide. So the purpose of that mulch, and, and you can see uh, this is the mulch layer in the uh, mulch layer in the following season is it slowly starts to decompose and it really kickstarts the microbial activity in the soil. Um, and it, allow, it, allows, uh, it, it allows that microbial uh, community to change the, the living environment in our soil. So uh, I don't know if you can see in the foreground, 
but the, the green that you see there is actually the same unwanted species that the pigs were grazing. These are sedge grasses. Um, and th the idea is that um, the sedge grasses exist in the soil because they're, um, the soil environment isn't right for the, the plants and the grasses that we want to be grazing with our cattle. And so when we put that mulch layer down, um, those sedge grasses uh, come back the first season. But as we uh, allow that mulch layer to decompose and that microbial community to thrive, uh, the season afterwards, the sedges um, only make up about 25% of the community and the grasses start out competing it. And we can, uh, we can work uh, with the cattle to, to help those grasses take over the sedge community. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this is that same mulch layer a few, uh, a few weeks later. And what you can see there is a really heavy stand of clovers, um, uh, which are indicative of the amount of um, bacteria that are, are, have found its way uh, into that uh, mulch layer and are starting to decompose it. So we see uh, the first plants that come through are the clovers, and then a season afterwards, uh, they're replaced by grasses. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a map of our farm, um, and I, I just wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the planning that goes into this, um, because it it uh, it can be quite complicated. It's not as easy as just um, putting the cattle out uh, onto the field. So this is a map of our farm. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our grazing rotation. So it's the same map of the farm that I just showed except um, it now has a, a bunch of blue and, and, um, and red lines running across it. And this is the migration pattern that we uh, follow with the herd on our farm. Um, so again, we're trying to mimic wild grazing animals that never stay in one place uh, for a very long time. The herd is constantly moving. And so we're trying to do the same on our farm. And so every season we plan out what our mi migration pattern is going to be. Um, we generally uh, get about seven, uh, seven uh, rotations through each field. So we'll be in each field about seven times in a season. Um, next slide, please. And this is kind of the math behind it all. Um, at, at, its, um, at its essence, what we're trying to do is, um, is keep the cattle in the field long enough so that they can take one bite off each plant and leave the rest. Um, and so we use a, a formula, which is written at the top there, uh, to calculate how much time we want the cows to stay in a specific field. And it, it has to do with the size of the field divided by the total size of the farm that we're grazing and the number of days in the rotation. Um, and you can see across the top there, 9, 15, 22 and a half, 30, 45, and 60. Those are kind of the different rotation lengths that we use throughout the season. Um, and the, which, which rotation length we choose has to do with what month of the year it is. Uh, so for example, right now we're grazing at a nine day rotation. The reason for that is it's springtime, the grass is growing very, very fast. And we want the cows to move through the fields very, very fast to keep up with the grass. Um, later on in the season, it'll slow down a lot and we'll hover somewhere between 30 and 45 days. And then at the, very, the last pass will be a 60 day rotation. Um, there are lots of variables that go into determining what the, the rotation length is. Um, it, can, it can be as simple as like, oh, it's cloudy today. Um, and so we need to slow down the rotation. Or, you know, it's quite dry. Um, so we need to slow down the rotation a little bit. We just had a, a rainfall the night before and the, the skies are blue today, lots of sun. That grass is growing super fast, so we need, we need to decrease the length of our rotation and graze it faster. Um, so uh, it's, it's quite complicated, um, or uh, it's quite simple, but it can, we can make it as complicated as we want. Um, and so a lot of the learning that I'm doing at the moment and that many farmers who are doing uh, similar practices to us are really starting to figure out like what are all the variables that we need to keep track of and how do we, um, how do we 
mythologize or how do we make this into a, a method that that works and is easy to teach to others um so it's a cross between an art and a science um and the, the more we practice it the more we learn and the more we know how to do this um this grazing um practice is about uh i think 10 years old we're we're right at the frontier of uh, of how we're grazing cattle um, using this method and um there's lots of learning going on and there's lots of sharing going on with other producers, um, not through any formal means, but um, through YouTube videos and through uh, yeah, conversations with farmers who are also kind of in the sector. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to quickly touch base on on some of the questions related to the sector, but maybe I'll I'll save that to, for the question and answer. Um, next slide. Maybe there maybe there is none. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the last slide, Paul. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, for my last slide, I, I had uh, just um, written up my contact information. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to talk with people, especially uh, via phone call. Um, and, and so uh, if you have any questions or, or would like to learn how to do this, um, feel free to give me a call. Um, maybe um, I can write that up in the question and answer um, or in the chat window. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, are you staying with us until the end of this morning or this uh, session? Because you, you will have questions. There are some questions for you that you can answer at the end, if you're yeah, okay. Can uh, I can stay? Okay, great. Thank you very much. So that's very interesting. After the the plants, after the animals, then um, let's let's come back to the, to the soil, and um, I think we'll have now. The, the third uh, speaker for the for the day, um, we will welcome uh, Mrs. Uh, Vaught, Tori Vaught, from the Ontario Soil Network. So she will present herself and uh, present the Ontario Soil Network. Mrs. Vaught, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I'm Tori Vaught. I'm uh, I'm an impact driven consultant working to secure the future of soil health by supporting NGOs and government organizations with program design, um, uh, with my particular focus um, aimed at influencing behavioral adoption in agriculture and shaping the values of future leaders. The Ontario Soil Network um, is a farmer-led network aimed to improve Ontario soils by linking and supporting farmers across the province with resources to then be brought back to their communities in the individualized ways that are needed. Ontario agriculture has had strategies in place since the 80s to influence the adoption of soil health practices um, from incentive programming to, um, to extension staff uh, at our ministries. And, and now we're on to this next generation of farmers. And, and it's a great point to check in and see how we're doing and ask, is soil health the new norm? And uh, unfortunately, just to, to say, um, we're far from soil health being a normal practice in Ontario agriculture. And so we ask, why not? Uh, and this has been a question that has earned many of sociologists their PhD, but has yet to be put to rest. Um, but, but we do have some tools for, for framing the issue of adoption, um, one of them being systems archetypes. So in systems design, um, this, this situation of trying fixes um, and, and not really getting anywhere with them is it, called a fixes that fail archetype, um, where declining soil health has cried out for a resolution uh, and we've so we've created solutions quickly, um, but in in doing so, we've created solutions that simultaneously tell whole generation to value soil health separately from their agronomy, leading us to the underwhelming position that we're in today. So, if declining soil health is not 
the problem, but a symptom of the problem under this, um, under this archetype, uh, then what is the problem? Um, and that leads us to look at a different type of archetype. Um, the same archetype that underlies all of North America's tragedy of the commons issues. Um, it's, the issue is that soil health doesn't show up on a balance sheet, it's not part of determining the price of corn, and it certainly doesn't come up consistently around the dinner table. So it's not that it's not worthy of value, um, we just don't value it because we haven't made a place to be able to share that value. Um, so some effective solutions to the tragedy of the commons um, are, are mainly aimed at bringing the future a little bit closer um, to the viewer, um, but all of the solutions to the tragedy of the common archetype never lie at the individual level. Um, it's only when there's general agreement that managing those commons requires coordinating everyone's actions can, can these issues be settled equitably. So um, to track back to the list of questions provided to us to integrate into our presentations, um, who should be the main driver? Um, the, the official stance of the soil network, and my personal opinion, uh, would be F, all of the above. Um, it's important to, it's important from a um, systems archetype stance, as well uh, as according to, um, to some of the social theory and research um, that has happened over the last 30 years that we move forward with with an interconnected strategy. So the soil network has set about influencing change by using a social values tool belt. Um, namely, if we are to create a future agriculture that values the role in soil conservation and climate change and is informed and confident enough to adapt as the frontier of our understanding of these issues expands, we need to be connected to each other under one common goal. Um, with the soil network, um, we, used, we used systems design to help us frame the issue that we were seeking to solve, and we used a lot of social theory to, um, to come up with our solutions and to help us evaluate our programming. Um, so if our goal is cultural shift, then we look to theories such as the diffusion of innovation, wherein we have a really tangible goal called the tipping point, which is this, um, I guess, rule of thumb um, percentage of the population required to, uh, to be able to call adoption of a new technology normal. Um, <clears throat> that adoption to adopt or not adopt, not adopt has been uh, studied under the lens of economics as well as uh, sociology for um, for quite some time now and uh, at the very least we know that it is not actually a question of to adopt or not adopt there are many many steps in between from knowledge to persuasion um, to decision making and finally implementation and then later on confirmation um, that's where we get into some of the mechanisms that drive people along that decision-making pathway. Um, and so the two, um, the two bodies of work that the Soil Network looked to were uh, the theory of plant behavior and, um, and theories around mental models. So the theory of plant behavior, which is this um, bottom um, diagram, basically states that if you think it's a good idea and if you think that other people think it's a good idea, then you will intend to do it. But as we all know, intentions are far different from actual action. Um, in order to take action on soil health, uh, people need to think it's a good idea. They need to think that others think it's a good idea and they need to think that they will be successful 
successful at it. So, um, so perceived behavioral control is the word for that. And it's, and it's one that we've focused on a lot of our tools on influencing. Um, it's, a, it's a condition uh, that has been directly cor correlated with inclusion in community for success. Um, and in uh, the theory of mental models, um, it, are, it gives some of the um, some of the mechanisms for the success of community in influencing uh, whether someone thinks that they'll be successful. And and that's basically um, that in community um, with shared experiences a mentor and a mentee can have enough of an overlapping experience that uh, a mentor will have the insight um, to anticipate questions that the mentee maybe didn't know that they had or understand the meaning and context of a mentee's questions. Um, and not only that, but there is this um, very well-known factor of having um, having a mentor that you identify with. It's this see it to be it example, um, where if the person who is being successful and is teaching you how to be successful is someone who you identify with, um, then you will also feel like you can be successful and know the questions uh, and gaps that you need to bridge in order to be successful in adopting soil health. So that brings us to question number two. Um, what are the most important critical success factors for scaling up? Um, if that um, perceived behavioral control or our, like our feeling of whether or not we'll be successful is the difference between intending to do something and actually doing something, I argue that factors influencing that would be the most important. Uh, and so out of that list, um, the soil network would choose um, that effective skill learning and advisory services to increase adoption of good practices by other farmers would be uh, the ideal choice, um, but we would change it a little bit to kind of hone in on some of the known uh, sociological influencers for this factor and would replace services with networks um, instead so that um, people are not only receiving the information necessary to take action, but um, be, being connected to um, a vision of their future selves being successful at it. Um, and then question number three, the flip side, what are the main barriers? Um, for the same reason that the Soil Network has focused their mission to influence agricultural, agriculture's value systems, um, well, I would consider level of adoption and the industry value placed on soil health would be a barrier. Um, I would argue that that's actually because they base their values on the market uh, and the greater network of the entire supply chain doesn't or doesn't know how to value soil health. Um, market mechanisms um, and incentive programming, I would, I would be cognizant of jumping into a fix um, in specifically into a fixes that fail archetype without securing solutions for the greater problem of shared values. Uh, and so address, so suggest that addressing the issue of a lack of marketing mechanisms in a manner that better connects actors in the supply chain may provide the biggest impact. Um, and then um, looking to answer the question of like, where does four per thousand fit into um, to our essentially what is a SWOT analysis of how well we're all working together to influence soil health in Ontario? Um, I look to uh, what is in existence? What are we doing? What are we doing well? Um, and for the soil network, at least, we've really we honed in on exchange of information. We honed in on it through an immense volume of, of field days and shop talks and have uh, some online components through Zoom meetings, um, as well as a, an online crop tour platform on our website. <clears throat> um, and we've, 
we've taken um, we've taken a social norm educational marketing um, strategy to um, to not only better connect our um, our network members or the farmers involved with the SOA network, but um, but to expand our reach and to uh, help validate them as leaders within their communities. Um, all of this to say, um, if it is not us, it is um, OMAFRA extension staff or other organizations like the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario um, that are really honing in on exchange of information in Ontario well. Um, <clears throat> And then, too, there are, there are many existing players developing marketing opportunities, um, which, uh, you know, come with their own territory of problems like shifting the burden to farmers uh, and avoiding the actual problem of the inherent role of the consumer um, being kind of uh, in, in dissonance with um, the role of a resource sharer. Um, <clears throat> but marketing opportunities are certainly asked for repeatedly by soil stewards because at the end of the day, their efforts are not valued or, um, or don't show up in a way that is easy and tangible for them to value. Um, the option beyond marketing mechanisms is certainly incentive programming, which we already have, but um, with the general public more actively engaged could be larger and more impactful. Um, I certainly think to other communities in North America where the public has a more active role in, uh, in the connection of their tax dollars to the implementation of incentive programming to protect um, to protect soil health and water quality. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but then there are, there are existing organizations um, that have relationships with the general public already um, that could maybe take on that role in, in, a, in a more impactful way. The, the two sections that I see uh, for per thousand um, really stepping into a void and, um, and really supporting some, <clears throat> some real um, like system-wide issues that, uh, that, we, that we all face um, are um, having that international focus to support research um, with the explicit intention of connecting a diverse range of influential stakeholders along a spectrum of beliefs and values as they relate to soil health to create one common experience rooted in science that can then influence each stakeholder's audiences um, or otherwise the issue of best management practice adoption monitoring is a very uncomfortable and difficult role for existing capable players in Ontario um, and, and could certainly be a helpful role for four per thousand to assume. I think that agriculture would be uh, ready for some kind of monitoring so long as the implementing body and the proposed relationship of, uh, of, of data and intellectual property was uh, understandable and trustworthy, um, especially if it resulted in easier access to funding or to market premium. And that, um, that wraps up my quick, <laughs> a little bit longer than 15 minutes uh, presentation on the soil health or on the soil network and, uh, and on some of our answers to these questions. Um, yeah, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions later as they come up. Thank you very much, Tori. C can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, that, that was interesting. And also, thank you very much for the effort to try to answer the, the question that we ask. Um, we will ask also the same question to the participant at the end of the uh, of this uh, session, but uh, thank you for having made the effort to to try to answer those questions through your presentation. My pleasure. S 
so uh, there, there will be some question for you at the end. So we, we just wait for the, the last presentation of Mr. Jim Tokarchuk. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing well your name. Um, Executive Director of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada. So uh, Jim, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul. I'll just get my screen uh, in your view. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Soil Conservation Council of Canada. Um, and just to start with, I want to acknowledge what I've heard from the other speakers this morning. I'm always really struck when I hear um, farmers talk about <clears throat> the innovation and passion that they have for their um, for their land and how they manage their their farms. It's really yeah, it's really <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> It's really quite remarkable, and I, um, in in the in sort of in the context of today, um, you know, let's bear in mind that they are the the frontline personnel in this case. They are the ones that are doing the work that's putting the the carbon into the soil and managing the soil for all of us. So um, it's really really thrilled to see what they're doing, and to Tori, the this is the work that you're doing in supporting Ontario farmers. So I, I think it's been a been a very good morning for for me already. Now, I just need to make sure I can advance this properly. There we go. So in terms of who we are, the Soil Conservation Council of Canada um, is, uh, is a, is a farm, farmer based organization that's concerned with soil care, meaning uh, everything from erosion control, soil health, soil productivity, soil resilience, uh, so soil care in all its forms. Um, we have a membership that consists of individual farmers, uh, organizations within, within the business, um, and uh, some industry people who do support us. So that's, the, that's sort of who we are. And uh, the last bullet really is, uh, in different language, I would say that is, uh, that is saying that we see ourselves as advocates for soil health in Canada. Um, I wanna talk about our priorities very quickly. I know I'm between you and your lunch, so I'm gonna move as fast as I can. We have a couple of priority areas that, that I wanted to mention first because um, what it tells you about us is what we care about, what filters we use in, in picking work to do, um, and in general tells you um, what, um, what, we, uh, what we really care about. So number one area is research. We need, and these are not in any, they're, they're not prioritized in order, they're just, they're, they're just four things we care about. Um, we're interested in, in um, um, driving appropriate actions and investments uh, that bring up, bring about production practices that ensure sustainability. Uh, and in this, we think that one of the really important things is to is to, to maintain and support that relationship between farmers and researchers. So that there's a connection from the knees on the ground, through the through the bench, through the development of technology, and then back out to the farm field. Technology transfer is something that has been mentioned a couple of times today that transfer of knowledge and, and uh, Tori um, referenced it in her speech, um, that, that uh, we need to make sure that we have the mechanisms in place to help farmers do um, the work that they do. And uh, we need, um, we're, in a, we're in a situation now where the, the capacity of the ability across Canada is very scattered. Uh, some people say that, that the system is broken. Well, um, I think, I think it's uh, it's in need of it's in need of more work, it's in need of more effort, and if we want um, if we want to see um, our soil sustainable, it's something that we do need to invest in, and it's one of our big priorities. Um, next, obviously, is policy, seeing uh, helping uh, the decision makers both in government and and the private sector make policy decisions and, and program decisions. Um, uh, that, that um, support soil conservation and health in Canada. And lastly, in, in our priorities is, is public engagement. And I, I really think this is probably a, one of the toughest and most important areas of, of our priorities and, and of the situation with soil health in Canada. Uh, and it's been said before that, that um, soil, soil health is not, not part of the dinner conversation around 
around family tables, uh, except in, in selected farms across Canada and a few of us who are converted. We need to make soil as important as air and water to Canadians, and we're just a long, long way from that right now. So we have a job in engaging with all the public, with the Canadian public. And just very quickly, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of the things that we actually do. There's a couple of examples there where we contribute to federal and provincial policy and program development. We've been engaged with the Canadian Food Strategy. We have regularly been in front of the, the uh, House of Commons Standing Committee, and uh, we're a big part of uh, the technical support to the Ontario Soil Strategy. Every week in the third week of April, we celebrate National Soil Conservation Week, uh, which is an um, opportunity to bring soils to, um, to the forefront for, can for Canadians. We do that through activity in the press, social media, and something that we, we, uh, we call um, soil urundis. And I'm just gonna flip slides a bit. Here's a bunch of, bunch of farmers that, that are involved in a conservation district in Manitoba somewhere. This is in the spring, you can see up here, there's no leaves on the trees. With our partner, um, um, Stanfields of Canada, we supply them with nice fresh white um, underwear in the spring and we ask them to bury it and then come back in, in, in the summer. And you can see the leaves and the trees there, that's in July. And that living, breathing soil has, and it's hungry, has consumed that cotton uh, underwear for the carbon that's in it. And we use that as a, as a very simple demonstration. And we use it in schools and other places to get the point across that, that soils aren't inert, they're not just dirt under our feet, they are living, breathing things. So, we do, we, do, we do a couple of things like that. We work with partners um, in industry to deliver um, programs like Operation Pollinator, you know, developing pollinator habitat, biodiversity habitat on farmland. We run, <clears throat> excuse me, we run uh, two national award programs. Uh, we've been involved in um, for our nutrient management training. And uh, one of the part of the, the one of the projects I want to stop on because I think it's really relevant to, to this meeting is um, we have a, pro a program a project underway called optimizing optimization rather of carbon in Canada's managed soils. We're doing that in partnership with the Compost Council of Canada and Glenn Monroe is I think somewhere on online here today. Soil Conservation Council of Canada and it's all made possible with funding um, from the Metcalf Foundation. Very quickly in that project, um, summing up uh, its goal and uh, its all of its goals is getting more people to put more carbon into soils, and that can mean farmers, it can mean land uh, land or soil managers, and as greenskeepers or um, in parks and cities, in, in private property, lawns, anywhere that that can be done. Couple of just a couple of words on what we're doing in there, what the deliverables are. Uh, we're developing a, a roadmap, which is a tool for um, policymakers, decision makers, um, industry, and others to um, get to the, the point of maximizing or optimizing carbon in soils. I don't have time to get into details there, but it's sort of a path, critical path that we we hope to offer people to follow in designing their responses to optimizing carbon in Canadian soils. Uh, some tools for them to, um, to use in, in particularly people who are putting the carbon in soils to, for them to use um, to be successful in getting their four per thousand um, done. Commitments from, uh, commitments from partners and stakeholders uh, that um, that uh, refer to them sharing information, collaboration, and just generally working together in, uh, in Canada um, towards, towards increasing soil carbon. And we, we see this project contributing to the, to the national leadership um, uh, uh, of soil health and soil carbon in Canada. We're in, we're in the second year of the two-year project. We finished um, some of the, the, the pre-development uh, phases. We've completed the, uh, most of the consultations. We've done a number of, and Glenn has done many of these. 
I've been involved in some of the uh, meetings with individuals at group settings and lately over Zoom after COVID-19 hit. Um, in 43 interviews, uh, we've gathered huge volumes of information, including other research that's been done outside of the interviews. We have about 15 or 20 more of those to do. We're in the process of sorting through those key findings and analyzing the data. And then in the fall, um, we'll, be, we'll be developing the, uh, the, the documents of, of, the, uh, of the project, the, the roadmap and the toolkit. So we hope that uh, we'll be concluding this project by the end of the year. And again, thanks to Metcalf Foundation for the generous support. So in terms of the questions and answers, that's really where we need to get focused here. Um, is the, is I took a very similar approach um, as, as Tori did in, in, her, um, in her presentation. I wanted to go directly to the questions and what you'll see here is, is the, my best possible representation of what our board members would, um, how, the, how our board members would collectively respond. Uh, they are in the, literal, literally in the driver's seat. They're, uh, they're, they're all, are, by the most part, our, our board of directors is in, in the driver's seat of their tractors trying to get crops in this year. So I was able to talk to a few of them and um, that do my best interpretation. So um, to, to question one, uh, which really talks about who the main drivers should be. And first of all, before I explain my numbering system, I'm going to I'll say that I I really wrestled with picking one, <clears throat> and for the most part failed because I think some of these things are so close together and so intertwined um, that it's hard to do. And I think that I think that in many cases um, success demands that more than one of the choices that we were given here is is enacted and, and given high priority. So, um, but in the case of in the case of question one about who should be in the driver's seat, it was very clear to me. It has to be farmers who are driving this because if if it's if they're not driving it, it's not going to get done. It's their land land labor and capital is being used to put the carbon back into the soils, and unless unless they're driving this in a way that that um, works for them, it's not going to work. Very close behind that is everybody else in the order I ranked them, but you know certainly there needs to be public support. So that's where I, where I put public authorities behind that. Farmers can't do it on their own. They need that support. Number three is consumers and civil society are gonna drive it. So uh, you gotta acknowledge that. We need science and we need private sector um, behind it. So that's sort of my order of priorities for that one. Um, so here's a, here's a, here's an example of where the horse race was a photo finish, and I couldn't I couldn't make an argument to separate the top three. So the the ones with number one, uh, effective skills and learning. Well, I I think I already talked about that, but that's about that's really about getting our extension and knowledge transfer system working effectively for people. Again, market recognition um, uh, I think is a, is a critically important one. Um, unless there's uh, unless there's a market for for uh, for good practices um, in soil management and carbon in particular, um, it's going to be hard for, hard to ask farmers to do that in the long run. Uh, the economic support during transition, uh, I also labeled as as number one, and again, it's it's not just it's not just the economic support in transition. It's also I think we have work to do in describing and, and identifying and enumerating the benefits that um, uh, come from the kinds of activities we're talking about in terms of increasing uh, increasing uh, productivity, um, increasing uh, resiliency of the soil, reducing operating costs. Those things need to be studied. We, so we were asked a question on another call yesterday um, on, on the cost and benefits of, of conservation activities. And it's a tough one to answer. We have a lot of work to do there. So I think the whole question of, of the economics of, of conservation activities needs to be looked at. Um, a long time ago, uh, somebody I worked with in, in Saskatchewan said, his father who was a crusty old uh, grain farmer in Saskatchewan used the phrase, uh, if it pays, it stays. And so if conservation practices pay on the farm, they will stay on the farm. And by the way, the 
person that told me this actually eventually got shipped off to university, so I guess he didn't pay. Um, so again, the question of science comes up. Um, it's critical to success. It's very close behind my number ones. And I put um, the, legal, the legal environment um, as number nine, not that I, I'm married to a lawyer, so I think that's important, but um, I think that it's so far behind and uh, there's very little, very little um, uh, uh, involvement with the legal community around environmental issues. So I just put it at nine because I think it's so far behind. Um, <clears throat> so question, question three talked about barriers. Um, again, it's, I guess, pretty obvious from my comments on the, la on the last question, um, unfavorable, unfavorable market mechanisms. Um, and uh, prices uh, support during transition are, are it's probably the linchpin if we can if we can find a market in a market influence it will move this very quickly um, number two um, we always need more science it's 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 close behind in in, in this one let's sure I got the, the the meaning of the low level of adoption of good practices by other farmers. Um, if that means if that mean, if that means um, they're not doing the things they see their neighbors doing, I guess I agree. Um, and again, the legal environment seemed to fall a long, long way behind. Question four: A lot of choices there. I didn't use numbers. Um, I, I I really like this question, by the way. I think it was the one that 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 I spent the most time thinking about. I gave each one an L, an, the letter L or the letter C, the letter L meaning we, I see the role of leadership for this organization on that, on that issue. And C means I see, I see, um, I see uh, contribution possibilities. So um, raising general public awareness, facilitating exchange of information between key actors development of recognition of, of labels and advocacy and outreach to policymakers. I see those already as very crowded fields in Canada. And, and I think um, I would advise caution in, in the context of this conversation, uh, support, contribute, but there's a lot, of, a lot of boots on the ground working on those areas already. I think where the gaps and where the opportunities for, for um, this initiative lie is in the latter too. Um, uh, promoting and facilitating the, uh, the, the international partnerships. That's hard, hard for us to do domestically, and I, I really welcome, really welcome this initiative in that respect. And and then again, in the question of the uh, promotion, facilitating uh, cooperation internationally in the science field, absolutely essential. I think that I think that this group can play a very, very strong role in in moving those things forward. In terms of the the uh, question five, um, I think some I think some data data gathering information surveillance, if you will, is is important. Uh, generally, in the soils area, Canada has really fallen behind in in its in its monitoring of soils in in the last few decades. But I think the I think the I think the issue is, is of, of measuring the measuring the work of individual farmers who's going to be problematic from the viewpoint of logistics, privacy, and um, and data management, data security. Uh, I think probably the most likely approach is to use the remote the remote um, methods of satellites, drones, and other, other sensors or other uh, sensors. Um, I, it's, it's a tough question. I just, I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that the direct approach is going to work. I think we have to do this by, by the remote means. And I think the acceptance of that data uh, will be a lot, will be a lot higher. Uh, last questions. Uh, where could you expect compensation from? Um, my, my answer is both again, because I, I think, because I think that the there has to be a market, has to be a market, uh, uh, 
for this, but it's not there yet. So in the short term, I lean towards um, uh, looking at uh, environmental, so the, the, the notion of environmental goods and services to help us get started and finding the value of, of the true value of, of soil health and conservation and the true value of the services we provide. I think it's an initiative that's got legs in Canada and it may be one that um, we can look to for compensation before we get it from the marketplace. So um, I think that's probably close to my time, uh, Paul. So thank you and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for this presentation and also for the effort to answer the question. Uh, I was not expecting that you were spending so much time to answering all the questions. Just my, my purpose was just to give you time during your purpose to to give some element of answer, but that's what that's good. That give the and feeling Paul, of Paul, this. Can I just quickly ask? Um, can I just spend one minute to kind of reflect on the on the uh, questions that were asked? Sorry, who is speaking? This this is this is Paul Slump, um, the the farmer. Um, I did not yeah. uh, in my time get to answer some of these questions. And um, I, if I could spend one minute to reflect uh, quickly. Uh, I would appreciate it. Yes, sure, sure. One minute. You have one minute. Uh, just, just a, Paul, before you start, uh, I just would like my colleagues from uh, Regeneration Canada to start the, the, um, the questionnaire. And all the participants that will be online can see now on the screen uh, all the questions that was answered by uh, Jim and Tori and that Paul want to answer now. So you, you have time now until the end of this session to give your answer to those questions. And be, you just have to choose um, the, the best uh, answer that you think is the most important. So thank you very much to, for doing that. And I give the floor to, to Paul again. Great. Put your uh, camera uh, on Paul, if you can. Yeah. Great. Yep, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, my apologies for not addressing um, these questions uh, earlier. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, the Green Revolution, actually, and, and what has made destructive agriculture work so well around the world. Um, and, and I think uh, from studying like the success of the Green Revolution, I, um, I think there are some lessons that we can learn there. Um, specifically around um, the efficacy at, at which the, the knowledge institutions, the universities, extension agents readily were the, were the, the uh, projected this information of how, of how to use fertilizers. And, and what was so appealing about it um, was that um, there was such a stark difference between not using chemical fertilizers and pesticides versus the older methods. And I think um, as, an organiza as organizations, we need to think through like, how do we contrast this, this healthy form of agriculture that sequesters carbon with the conventional form of agriculture? And how do we make sure that we use uh, government institutions and extension agents to, to kind of bring all of this information out into the countryside. In terms of a, a, a market driver, I actually don't see much of a, a, a space for a, a market driver in this. Um, based on like what we've seen with organics, yes, organics are growing, but uh, farmers do get paid a little bit more, but at the same time, like why, why is not everybody practicing organic? I, I think uh, I see much more room in a regulatory and, and subsidy environment. Um, I, I think farmers who, who choose to uh, use um, destructive practices should pay enormous amounts of property tax, um, for example, and farms who don't, um, who practice regenerative practices should um, get breaks on their property tax or even be paid for those things. I think with a very simple carrot and a stick model, you can very quickly incentivize people to do the right thing. Um, I also think that the direct uh, data collection is quite useful for farmers to, um, to um, 
to actually have access to that data and help that as a decision making tool. I think data is highly missing in what I do on my farm. And I would love for somebody to take over the data capture to help me make smart decisions on our farm. And I think that we can actually offer that as a service to farmers, uh, as opposed to seeing it as a big brother thing, it's actually a service to help us make better decisions. Um, and in terms of the legal environment, I, I, I know Jim mentioned that it wasn't very important. Um, from my perspective, I, I know that I do many things on my farm uh, illegally, um, but I do them because I know they're, they're good for the soil and good for the climate, um, but they're, they're stressful because um, the authorities could easily shut me down. Um, so uh, I do think that, that the legal perspective is, is, is very important to, to allow and to create space for the innovation that is happening uh, in terms of um, regenerative agriculture. Great, uh, I'll, I'll put myself on mute, thanks. Thank you very much, Paul, for, for this precision. Uh, I would encourage the people who did not yet use the, the question to use it and give their answer. We have only 14 answers at the moment and you are more than 70 online. So please go ahead and uh, use it. So meanwhile, um, we have a question. Yeah, it just linked to what we just discussed a few minutes ago. Um, the question by Alain just said, uh, do we are not in the good direction for, for the need for offering a financial support to agriculture that would be linked to the conditionality to have a good quality of soil. This is what we call in French eco-conditionality. And um, so uh, as Paul just already starts speaking, um, Tori, can you, do you have a piece of answer to that? Oh, <laughs> um, gosh. Uh, so, in order to link economic incentivization with soil outcomes, with soil function outcomes, um, I, I think that the scientific community needs to be on the same page uh, in terms of like soil health assessments <laughs> and like what, um, like what especially uh, in geographical terms is good healthy functioning soil like to be honest i um i think that's a a great idea and an ideal that certainly uh the ministry of agriculture and our research institutions and private um companies like a and l like that that is a, a holy grail but um but that is one that we're still uh far from um coming to consensus on Okay, and while you have the floor, Tori, um, can you uh, answer the question? People ask, um, how are you communicating the financial impact of the conversion for both a cost and a revenue perspective? And how do, do you frame that in a timeline for, for investment uh, vs. cost saving? Right, um, so, uh, so far, what the Soil Network has done uh, to support um, farmers, in farmers in communicating um, that concept of, of how their conversion to soil health practices has, um, has balanced out financially um, uh, is we run them through um, a, a cost-benefit analysis projected usually over over five to seven years. Um, we are um, starting a project with Ag Canada through their Living Labs initiative, um, looking to create uh, some, some better risk modeling and cost benefit analysis tools, um, not only on the farm scale, but on watershed scales um, and, uh, and with temporal variance, not only from from five years, but intergenerationally as well, um, because certainly time um, and long scopes are uh, are really important in understanding the economic value um, of, of these conversions um, for the individual farmer. Um, yeah, that's that's what we're doing so far. 
Okay, th thank you, Tori. Um, Jim, um, just the same question that I asked to, to Tori. Um, what do you think about the fact to offer uh, a financial support to agriculture uh, in order to push farmers to, to have a better quality of soil uh, while they are working? So the, the question I think can, is... Can you is, switch your camera on? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. There I am. So the, the question is, is, uh, is about um, transition funding to, for farmers to undertake conservation practices. Um, personally, I'm, I'm a great supporter of it. I think there's a case to be made for it. Um, uh, I, one thing that comes to mind is um, David Lobb at the University of Manitoba has done work on the cost of soil degradation in Canada. And his numbers are uh, that, that the cost of soil degradation, including organic matter and erosion and all of the things that reduce production, is somewhere around four billion a year going backwards in time and increasing as time goes forward. So there, that in a sense creates a, an argument for a pool of money to support the conversion to conservation measures. So I think if we use our imagination and, and the right rhetoric, we can, we can develop the case for, for that. Um, secondly, I think that I think that soils in Canada are under enormous pressure from a lot of things, climate change, uh, change in crop productions, pest, changes in pest management, um, and, and extreme weather. And so we're asking, and on top of that, we're asking soils to produce environmental goods and services. And um, if, we want, if we want that big public good from soils, that soils can provide us as a, as a species and as a country in Canada, then I think we have to help to make the investment in it. And that's, so that's why I think that there is a very strong case to be made for public support in the transition to, uh, to more sustainable practices. Thank you, Paul. Um, I would like to insist on the fact that uh, we, we have only half of uh, the attendants who use the, the question here, and only 28 answer against 20, 66 participants. So please go there and give your opinion on, on those questions. This is very important for the, for the follow-up of what all we are talking about. Uh, Jim, I have another question for you. Uh, do you think that a multilateral trade agreement in agriculture be a means to scale up practices respectful to of uh, soil health? What could be the, the role of the multilateral trade agreement in, in the, the the seek for a better soil health in the practice? Well, I think uh, I, the one thing that comes to mind immediately is that uh, soil health is a uh, is is a benefit to people outside of Canada as well. We're an exporting nation. And in a sense, it doesn't make sense for us as, as a country to, to pay the full cost of sustainable production. Um, and that perhaps some of the, the importing nations for our, for our products have to play a role in it. So um, it's, I support the notion. It's way, it's way over my head in terms of international trade, but I think there's what I'm trying to say is that I, I can see a path of logic to it because soil health is a, is a thing we share across borders because we move food and, and energy and, and all kinds of agricultural products across borders. And so uh, it, it seems to me to have a place in, in, those, in the development of those trade agreements. Thank you very much. Um, Paul, um, just a small question for you about um, wh what do you think the, the place of the tree could, could have in your, in your landscape? I mean, the people just compare the fact that uh, when you, you see the picture from your, um, your farm and the picture from, uh, from the, the farm of uh, Jocelyn, uh, there, there are no room for trees in the landscape. What do you think that the place of the tree could be in your landscape? And do you don't think the, the trees could be planted in the place where the, the soil is not so productive for grass, for instance? 
how, how do you consider the place of the tree in your form? Yeah, great, great question. I, I would love to plant uh, trees in all of our fence lines and potentially in all of the pastures as well. Um, I think it, it, it kind of raises the point of a barrier. We, um, to make this farm run economically, um, I am working, um, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks to do it. Um, and, you know, trees, there are a number of practices that I think would greatly increase the amount of carbon we can sequester on our land. One of them would be to plant trees. The other one would be to in incorporate um, multi-species cover crop mixes in our pastures. Um, but both of those things require uh, both financial resources to implement and time, neither of which uh, we have in, access, in excess of at the moment. And so um, there are projects that I'm thinking about and I want to implement. Um, and I, I hope that we can uh, put aside some cash and some time to implement those in the next five to 10 years. But um, yeah, the economic success of our farm depends on our grazing uh, livestock and selling of meat. And, and so that's where the priority lies at the moment. Thank you, Paul. Um, just uh, encourage the people who still have some minutes to, to answer the, the, the question here. Paul, just a, a question that I will ask to, to Tori and Jim as well. What is your feeling about the use of biochar? Um, so I've had friends who've done a lot of work in biochar and who swear by it. Um, I personally, my feeling is that um, we have such an amazing, uh, uh, such amazing biology in the soil that that can do so much to sequester carbon from from plant matter that is growing on the soil surface that. I, I, I feel like that resource of soil microbiology is underutilized in, in the carbon sequestration. And I would much rather see us put our attention into maximizing the biology in the soil to, to sequester carbon rather than focusing on um, some, some other process that we as, as people need to be involved in um, outside of the soil in order to incorporate to the soil. That, that's my only thought. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tori, a thought about the uh, use of biochar in Ontario? Um, sure. My, um, my opinion would be uh, probably rooted very similarly to Paul's, where, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great research on biochar, uh, especially in animal operations and the, and the transition of, um, of its attributes over to compost. Uh, however, um, if we're looking at large scale adoption of soil health, if we're looking to influence not just like the fringe or the leading edge uh, to adopt soil health practices into their norm, um, then we, can, we can't offer uh, products that are the silver bullet and we can't offer a narrow experience experience of soil health. We have to offer a plethora of solutions available to people so that they feel like they have some kind of autonomy and can see themselves uh, in the soil health movement um, and, and so that they don't uh, automatically, um, you know, roll up their windows and drive away. Okay, and to finish, Jim, what is your opinion about biochar? I agree with, uh, with both the uh both Tori and uh, and Paul, um, I, I think that it it's it's important. We have a, a large toolkit of things that we can offer to people. This is one of them. But when I think of what we saw from in uh, Jocelyn, Jocelyn's presentation this morning, that that activity I think is probably many times more important right now than than um, a single practice. Um, I also think that it, its application is going to be on smaller, more intensively managed acreages. Uh, I look at Western Canada where, where you know, some farmers are managing um, thousands of hectares of land, 
this is not a practice they're going to undertake. Their option is going to be to look after soil biology, return residue to the soil, and reduce tillage. And that's that's what we need to support on the massive acreages. But hey, every we need we need every tool that we can find. Thank you very much. So I think um, we've been around. Uh, there are still some questions, but uh, we we are at three minutes of the last of uh, the three minutes of the end of of our session. I think we will have not have time to have some other question. Um, please, you were only thirty one to answer to to our uh, to our question. Yeah, but it's not too bad anyway. Um, so. As we have now reached the end of our second session, I would like to thank all of our speakers as well as uh, all of you for your participation, your question and for the question here. Thank you for your loyalty. Yesterday we were 92 online at the end, at the eight of the session. And today we were 80 at the most. So it's, it's really very good for us. And thank you very much. So I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time for our third session devoted to, to scientists. Uh, you can, uh, you can, we will now end the, the, the questionnaire and it's closed. So you will have the answer. Uh, tomorrow, maybe we will uh, give you the answer of the, the questionnaire of today. So uh, I would like to finish telling that, um, please note that as for each session, tomorrow's meeting will be accessible via a specific uh, Zoom link, different from the one we use today. So uh, you will find this link on the agenda of the regional meeting. And uh, on those words, I would say bye-bye uh, to you and we will share the, the result of the, the pool tomorrow uh, for all of you, uh, except if Sarah want to take the floor Last yeah, time. Just, uh, just very quickly before we leave, I just wanted yes. to, to thank everyone today. I wanted to thank our farmers, uh, Paul and Jocelyn, uh, who's not here with us anymore. It's always great to hear directly, directly from our farmers. Uh, thank you, uh, Tori and Jim, also for sharing with us uh, your perspectives and the amazing work that you're doing uh, at your organizations. Um, thank you, Paul, again. It's such an honor to be able to, to co-host these sessions with you. And uh, like Paul said, uh, we'll be sending an email also later today um, with uh, some of the PDFs of the, the slides uh, that uh, the, the speakers showed today. And we'll also be giving more information for tomorrow's session. Uh, so we'll be giving you the Zoom link for tomorrow and as well as the, the questions for tomorrow's poll. Uh, so thank you everyone again for, for joining us today. Paul, did you have anything else uh, to add before no, we go? That's it, just, just bye bye and have a good day and uh, hear you tomorrow. All right, bye everyone. Bye.